Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good to see everyone here, and we're happy for those joining us uh, online on Facebook this morning. So welcome. Uh, how many of you have been outside this morning so far? A couple so far. Uh, if you haven't, uh, I'd encourage you uh, after church at some point to, it's such a beautiful day today and supposed to be a, uh, just an incredible day. And uh, it's, there's, there's not a better way, I think, to relax and to focus on the blessings that the Lord has given us uh, by being outside. So one of the perks of living, I think, in central Texas uh, this time of year. Uh, we just have one big announcement, and that is, I believe we're not having a children's service today. So I think we had some technical difficulties, so we're going to ask the children to stay in here with us, and uh, we'll proceed with our program then. Uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your many blessings. We want to thank you for everything that you've given to us. Uh, our blessings, if we think about it, are too numerous to count. We know, though, that there are people that are struggling today, uh, either with health or other issues, and we ask for your, your, your comfort to them and for, you, for them to know that you're by their side uh, when things are, are rough in life. Um, please uh, be with us and be with Pastor Josh today. Please uh, let his words be uplifting and, and let us leave here with a heart of gratitude and praise uh, for all that you've done for us. We ask this in your name. Amen. today all right we got a couple if you want to come up a little closer you can or you can stay where you're at either way I think I can be loud enough so y'all can hear well now that things are getting warmer I remember when I was a kid what I like to do in the summer heat is I'd like to go to the lake and go splashing around in the water it was great fun I'm from Minnesota Minnesota is known as the land of 10,000 lakes. There's actually 11,842 lakes in Minnesota officially, but that doesn't sound quite as nice and neat and say the land of 10,000 lakes. Well, there's a lake about everywhere. And one place I would go to in the summer, I would go to a summer camp and it was called North Star Camp in Brainerd, Minnesota. And uh, I'd go up there and it was so much fun Summer camp was so fun. We'd do horseback riding, canoeing. They'd have crafts like ceramics. It was great fun. And one of the things they had, they had a lake, like, like there is everywhere in Minnesota. There's a lake there, and they had a dock, and kids would like go running under, down the dock and jump off into the lake and have a good time. The only thing is, I would have liked to do that, but I didn't know how to swim. So when I was nine years old, one of the classes I took at North Star Camp was called Beginner Swimming. And they would teach me, they said, okay, what you do is you take a gulp of air, and then when you bring your head down in the water, you blow the air out. <laughs> and then you turn your head this way, catch another gulp of air, and blow out. So it was like... <gasps> <sighs> and I would do that. And then they say, now we need you to take your arms and you go over your head and swish like that. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And then they say, okay, now with your legs, I'll pretend these are my legs, you kick them back and forth. And I would do that. And they say, good, now do them all together. Whoa, oh, man, I couldn't figure that out. And, and uh, I... I I didn't learn how to swim. So I went back when 10 years old. I signed up for beginner swimming a second time. And they said, wow, you're doing such a good job. Whoosh, whoosh, tuk, 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 tuk. And then I couldn't, I couldn't get it. 
three times I took beginner swimming. And, and honestly, they passed me the third time. I don't know how because I really couldn't do it, but somehow they checked it off that I completed it. But I still couldn't swim. And I was already 11 years old. And I thought, you know what? I'm a lot taller now. One time I was going by the, the, the dock, by the lake, and thought, you know, even though I can't swim, I wonder if I'm tall enough that I could stand in the water at the end of the dock and, and be above water. So I walked into the lake, and I, I, yeah, sure enough, it was kind of up to my chin, but I was tall enough I could stand in the water. And uh, there was nobody around, I went back up, and I ran off the dock and jumped into the lake. But you know, I didn't calculate that by running and jumping. I got farther away than I had estimated and measured. And when I sunk down and it went way past my head, I knew I was in trouble then. And as I finally hit the bottom where I felt my feet hit the, the lake bed, I pushed up as hard as I could and I came up and I got a gulp of, a gulp of air. But then I went back down again. And this time I didn't have as much force. So I just, my feet barely touched the bottom. I could push up only a little bit. And the second time I came up, I caught a little bit of air and I swallowed a little bit of water. And I went down a, another time. This time when I came up, I didn't even break the surface, just my eyes and I couldn't get any air. Fortunately for me, uh, a camp counselor, I didn't realize this at the time, but a camp counselor saw me, and she got down there in the water, and she saved me from drowning because uh, I was done for. I couldn't, I couldn't swim, and I was over my head, and, and, and she saved me, or, or I wouldn't be here sharing this story today. Um, I remember her last name was Dickinson, and her initials was spelled the word sad, S-A-D. I think it was Shelley Ann Dickinson or something like that. Maybe it was Sandy, but it was S-A-D. And uh, she saved me from drowning at, at that camp. Now, there's a lot of lessons you can take from this. One important thing is don't play in the water by yourself. Always have someone around. Even if you know how to swim, it's much safer to have somebody there if you're playing in the water than, than being by yourself. A second thing is that we can't save ourselves from sin. We are going to die before our sins, but for Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can save us from our sins, and we have to accept his salvation in order to live with him for eternity and remember that. Thank you for hearing my story. Good morning, church. It's good to be back for a quick little trip. Um, I always enjoy coming back home and the opportunity to share some music with you. And so today I'm going to sing a song it's called Lean Back by Amanda Cook. And I'm just going to read the chorus for you before I sing. It says, I will lean back in the loving arms of a beautiful father. Breathe deep and know that he is good. He's a love like no other. Space to. 
to breathe so I'll stay still until it sinks in and I will
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's really good to be in the house of the Lord, uh, worshiping together. Those who are here present and also those who are joining us online, uh, we, we pray that your experience will be uplifting and that you will feel closer to the Lord as we worship together. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you, Josie, for, for playing. What a blessing to have you with us this weekend. We miss you, girl. And it's great to have you back and active uh, serving. Praise the Lord. Uh, today I would like to ask, uh, I would like to start a, a new series of messages. And uh, I decided to go over the Gospel of John. Uh, there's 21 chapters. So there's a lot of information. We may not be able to capture everything uh, through this series. But I'm going to do my best to, to present the highlights, the things that I, I believe are important for us to, to consider. So before we start uh, the message today, uh, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to guide us as we study. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for giving us Jesus Christ. Thank you for his sacrifice. Also, thank you because he rose again. And we can have assurance of eternal life. Today, Lord, as we study together, as we dive into the uh, book of John, we recognize that we need your direction. That my plans, my ideas are not enough. That unless you are present, unless you come into our hearts, there'll be no lessons to learn. There'll be no, no inspiration to receive. So, Lord, please reveal yourself to us this morning. Guide us as we study together. Use me as a vessel, Lord, as just as a channel of blessings to your people this morning. Hide me behind our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. People often uh, seek Jesus expecting to experience uh, the, this, this phenomenal thing. But if people really want to know Jesus, they should open the Gospel of John. I'm convinced that we should open all the Gospels, but especially the Gospel of John. John the Apostle, not John the Baptist. John the Apostle is the one that wrote the, the Gospel of John. He also wrote four other books in the New Testament. He wrote the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he also wrote the book of Revelation. Five letters in total from this faithful disciple. By the time John picked up the pen to write his gospel, the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had been written already. So John wrote the gospel about 30 years after the other three wrote the narrative of the life of Jesus. The other guys had uh, already had their turn in sharing about Jesus. Now, as a grand finale, the, the fourth gospel comes, and it's John's turn. When you attend a memorial service, uh, there's, there's, a, there's usually a, a section of the program when you get to share your memories and, and reminisce and remember the things that impacted your life about, you know, the life of this person that the community is, is mourning. And I, each person, if you think about it, shares uh, different things. Some, some things are serious, some things are funny, uh, but usually each person has one specific thing in mind that they really want to share about the deceased. And after Jesus died, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John spoke about his beautiful life. And each one of them chose a different approach, an area where they felt impacted the most. Matthew sought to portray Jesus as, as the king of the Jews. He was appealing to the Jewish people, the Jewish mind, 
those who were in the audience, and he quoted from the Old Testament Jewish scriptures more than any of the other gospel writers. He wanted to prove that Jesus was the king, the promised Messiah. Mark takes it from a different uh, perspective. He portrays Jesus as a servant. Very interesting approach. As you know, at the time, Rome was the, the biggest political power. And in the kingdom of Rome, there were basically two groups of, of people, two classes of people, the masters and the servants. There were very few masters and a lot of servants. So Mark tries to reach the common people, like you and me, the common people in their day. Mark, by the way, is the shortest of the Gospels. You can read that, that his arguments were simple. He shows the evidence. And Mark is the one that records the most miracles of Jesus. And he wanted to portray Jesus as this humble servant that liked people and helped people. Uh, when it was Luke's turn... He wanted to talk about Christ's per perfection. He was the ultimate human being, according to Luke. Like, like I said, uh, Rome was the, the main political power, and they were fascinated with the Greeks. You know that in history. The Greeks had a huge influence in different cultures. And Luke attempts to reach that, that uh, Greek uh, mind and those who were influenced by Greeks and his uh, gospel with the philosophers, he also focuses on the artistic side of things. He's the only one that records Mary's uh, song when, he, when she received the news that she was going to give birth to the Messiah. He wanted to, to reach that Greek mentality that, that valued philosophy, that valued arts, that was educated. Luke records more of Christ's parables than any of the other Gospels. You know, the deep mind, the philosophical things that Jesus said, that would be very appealing to the Greeks, to the Gentiles. And these three gave their account, and now John comes. What is going to be his approach? How is he going to start? It's John's turn to step to the podium. And right away, he declares, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. He states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, Nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. When was the last time that you read the introduction of a book and the author says that someone is God himself. Think about it. Never. But that's exactly how Jesus is portrayed by John. Right from the beginning. Boom. Jesus is God. John is on a mission in his book. And right away he gets to the point. There's no set up story. There's no uh, prefacing. He declares, Jesus, who is the Word, is God. Isn't it interesting that many people have a difficult time believing that, that Jesus is God? I mean, there are so many different ideas of who Jesus was. And everyone has to acknowledge his existence because there's historical proof, even non-biblical Authors make reference of Jesus. They had no Christian agenda at all, but they, 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 they mentioned Jesus of Nazareth and his followers and how 
his followers, the Christians, were impacting the world. Historical proof, facts. But to believe that he is God? Wait a second. Even some of the most prominent and faithful Christians at some point doubted if Jesus was really God. I mean, how come the Son of God would have shrunk into a human Jew 2,000 years ago? And if you at times have found it difficult, how much more difficult would have been for his own disciples? I mean, they lived with him. Sometimes we see that as an advantage, right? But, but look at it from this perspective. They saw his humanity. They saw him sweat. They saw him cry. They saw him getting tired. They saw him being weak physically. They saw the creator of, a, of the universe as a human being. I mean, I, I picture the disciples sleeping under the stars on a warm summer night beside the Sea of Galilee, listening to the steady sound of the water, the, the lakes, the, the waves in the lake. And I, I can imagine John waking up at 3 a.m. He couldn't sleep. So, so he propped himself up, uh, you know, on his elbow and looked at the man that was sleeping right next to him. He was sound asleep. He didn't realize that John was up. And I can't imagine John thinking to himself, is this true? Can this guy be the eternal God, Yahweh, the creator of the universe? Did he spoke at one time and, and made this whole thing appear and happen? Am I crazy? To think it might be true. And at times we, we are all puzzled at him. The disciples didn't understand him fully. There's records in the scriptures that they constantly talked about them, among themselves, commenting, asking questions. Did he say that? How come? Think of the times that they were walking on the road, having their own private conversations, realizing that they were so out of loop <laughs> with many things that Jesus said. On top of that, John is believed that he was probably between 18 and maybe 25 years old tops. So he was a young man. When Jesus called him, he was working with his dad, Zebedee. He's a young dude. So he had all his life ahead of him. He could, he could easily stay and, and work in his dad's business, wanting to, to get better established, having a family, becoming rich. But instead, John chose Jesus and left all for him. John experienced in his own life the important decisions we often get to make. Should we go after my own dreams or should I submit to God's dream for me? And you'll be tempted just as John might have been tempted. But you and I, we need to continue to choose Jesus to choose his will for our lives. If you see John's life when he was older, when he writes the gospel, when he writes the, the, the book of Revelation, it's obvious that there's no regrets. There's no regrets about leaving that boat that could have brought financial stability. There's no regret in his words, in his attitude. He was convinced he did what was right. And when John was at the end of his life, he's so convinced of all the evidence he saw that he began to write down the recollections of those amazing three and a half years that he walked with Jesus. Jesus. 
And when he decides to start writing it, he declares the deity of Christ. This is the one who was in the beginning. He was with God. And he was God. The one thing that John wanted to get across about Jesus in the gospel is that he is Yahweh. He is God. Manuscript 29 of 1911. Thus John bears testimony that he had seen Christ, had been with Christ. In the early history of the Christian church, the enemy tried to bring in questions that would lead to doubt and dissension. At this time, the testimony of John was invaluable in establishing the faith of the believers. He could say with assurance, I know that Christ lived on this earth, and I can bear testimony regarding his words and his works. So if you have a problem believing that Jesus is God, the eternal God, then John is going to mess you up during the sermon series. I can assure you that. Because he will go through 21 chapters to make sure that there's no doubt in your heart that he is God. Another thing about the gospel of John that's fascinating to me is that it's so different. It's so unique. You see, the other three gospels are known as the synoptic gospels. By that it means that they were very similar. Matthew shares something that Mark also shares and Luke also shares. There may be some little differences on how they, they tell the story, but they pretty much tell the same instances, the same things that Jesus went through. They shared it from different perspectives, for sure. It is interesting that on our trip to Israel, because if you don't know, about two, and a half, two years ago, we went to, I went to Israel. It's an inside joke for those who are for the first time with us. Between the young adults and me, right? <laughs> but there was about 60 of us. And, and, and when we would get back to the hotel, when we would uh, eat together, there were so many different perspectives of things. And we spent only 10 days over there. Can you imagine walking with Jesus three and a half years? And even though the synoptic gospels have a unique and different perspective, they primarily focus on Jesus' ministry. The time he spent at the Sea of Galilee. He sort of established himself in the town of Capernaum. His base, his home, during those three and a half years. As a matter of fact, when you visit there, you're going to see a big old sign that says, Capernaum, the city of Jesus. You, there you'll find amazing ruins of a synagogue. And, and if you're familiar with the Synoptic Gospels, you'll realize that Matthew, Mark, and Luke focus on the time Jesus spent around the Sea of Galilee ministering to people, both Gentiles and Jews. But John is different. John focuses on the times when Jesus traveled down to Jerusalem. How he ministered there. And when you see, when you read the Gospel of, of, of John, you're going to have a different feel. It's clear that this young guy saw things different. The whole structure of the Gospel is different because it feels like you're just reading stories. It's like small novels. At least that's how I experience it. When I read John, it feels like he's pulling my shirt and pulling me near, and he's trying to get me up close and personal with Jesus, saying, come, look, it's deep. He's God. I feel as, as you want me to see what he saw, to hear what he heard, to admire what Jesus did, and to love him as he did. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Record both 
the teachings and the sayings of Jesus. For instance, Matthew shares his, his sermons. Matthew chapter 5 to chapter 7, you find the, the, the longest sermon of Jesus recording there, the Sermon on the Mount. But then in Matthew 24, you'll find what is called the Olivet Discourse, another sermon of Jesus. Luke decides to share Jesus' parables, his sayings, his teachings. Mark, as I mentioned, chooses to share Jesus' miracles like no other. But John records his one-on-one -on -one conversations with people like you and me. And that's why I love the Gospel of John. I love them all, but John is so unique. That's why I'm so excited to share this book with y'all. Because there's a big difference. I mean, if you admire someone that you, you, you've seen on TV, it's one thing, right? You, you, you can learn about them, you can read about them. But what if you could sit right next to them and have a chat, a conversation? How much different? How, how much more deeper? I mean, how much more special? How would it be? When we served in, in Arlington, my sister-in-law became friends with Elvis Andrews' mom. Elvis Andrews was, until this season, the starting shortstop for the baseball team, the, the uh, Texas Rangers. You know it, right? Uh, so we got to know him personally and his family. Uh, and, and my sister-in-law and his family became so close that they would celebrate birthdays together. Uh, they would get together to grill in the backyard. And it was awesome for us, especially for Diego, because we were allowed to sit where the family, the players' families sit and go to the area where they wait for the players to come out and get into their cars. Diego was starstruck the first time we did it. But the coolest thing for Diego was that afternoon when we were celebrating a birthday and he got to play catch with Elvis in the backyard. I believe Samuel Reeves was there too. And he was so cool for them, best friends, to, to play catch with a pro. See, that's different. One thing is to watch a, a professional athlete on TV, and another thing is to throw a ball at him. And for me, that's the difference between the other Gospels and the Gospel of John. John gives you front row access. I mean, imagine, you, you can be one of those people in the crowd following Jesus as, as, as he traveled through, through Galilee. Be one of the people in the crowd. Oh, that would have been awesome to hear him speak, to hear him preach sermons. But another thing is to have backstage access to him. To sit around that same small table meant for three or four other people only. Because John was not only one of the twelve. He was in the inner circle of Jesus, the three main disciples. And we'll study later how John shares the conversations. How he spoke to Nicodemus the Pharisee who eventually followed Jesus. How he snuck by the night. He was skittish. And, and, and John was obviously eavesdropping, listening to that amazing conversation between one of the most prominent leaders of the time and Jesus. John 4, we see the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Samaritan woman. And, and John is the only one who records that, that beautiful conversation. He must have asked Jesus, so what was that all about? John is the only one that records the conversation between Jesus and Pontius Pilate, the men who finally executed him. John ends with this amazing conversation between Jesus and Peter after his failure. 
Peter denied the Lord three times. John gets to eavesdrop in that personal, private, loving, merciful conversation between the Savior and his friend. It's amazing how John brings a different perspective. And he wants to make sure you and I get it. He wants to make sure that you and I understand that he's speaking, that he's writing because he knows about it. He didn't read about it in a book. He didn't hear the story from his grandparents. No, he was there. That's why when he starts his letters, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, he declares that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the ether- eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Verse 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Another version says, to bring you fullness of joy. You see, I'm sharing this because I want you to be happy. I'm sharing what I saw, what I witnessed, because I want you to embrace this same hope that changed my life. John says, listen, y'all, seriously, I saw him with my own eyes, and I can tell you he was rocking a stylish beard like Jarrett. John could say this. He could describe the shape of Jesus' hand. He could tell you the exact color of his eyes. He could talk about his voice. John could say, look, even if if I'm with my eyes closed and there's a hundred people around me, eventually I can tell the difference between other voices and the voice of Jesus. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, there's an instance where, when he hears the voice and he recognizes the voice and when he turns around, he's shocked because he sees something different because he knew the voice of Jesus. John could say things like, you know, I know the difference of tone in his voice. I can tell the difference between when he talked to the Pharisees And when he talked to the people who were mourning. The difference in his voice when he challenged us and also the difference, the tone of voice when he knelt down to tend to someone that was suffering. I hugged him, he can say. I touched him. I held his hand. And I can tell you, he was not a ghost. As some people believed back in the day. And I decided to describe my own experience with him, with you. To make your joy complete. John is saying, I can tell you. If whatever they say about Jesus is true or not. I can tell the difference just as Josh can tell the difference between a real Mexican taco and Taco Bell. Nothing against Taco Campana. Okay, it's just not the real thing, okay? They're good, but not that good. That's what John experienced, and he's saying, I received his joy. And I gave it up. I gave all up. So I want to offer you that same joy. So you may choose him. You can taste John's passion. I saw, I heard, trust me. That's why from the very beginning he's extremely direct. I saw him, I heard him, and you need him. Because he's everything. And without him, whatever you think you have is just an illusion.
John states that the only source of a connection to something that is actually real is Jesus Christ. He's saying, whatever you think about him, trust me. If you have viewed God as, a, as, a old, as an old mean guy in the sky that has a frown and is looking down at you, then you have a false image of God. Yes, he's grieved. And his heart is filled with pain. He knows how to cry. Because all that sin has caused, all the pain in this world, but please don't blame God for that pain. I saw it. As a matter of fact, he gave us a choice. Side note. If you blame God for the pain in the world, then follow that train of thinking and blame Henry Ford for all the accidents people get into on the road today. John shares that we can find true joy in Jesus. I was there, man. I was there on that trip when, when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter back to life. I was there, man. I mean, I was one of the, of the, of the very few that went into the room and we saw her, her pale skin and her eyes. She was dead, man. She was dead. But when he called her Talita Kumi, the, the color came back to, to, to her skin. And I saw her opening her eyes and speak. Man, you have no idea what it felt to see that poor little girl come back to life and the joy that her dad had. Joy. I know about joy. I've seen happy people when Jesus steps in. What about peace? Do you know about peace? I was so close to Jesus that I could sit right next to him anytime. We ate together. And after we were done eating, I would lean my head over on his chest. That is true peace. In his gospel, John is saying, do you doubt? Man, I was there. I saw Thomas. I saw his hand reach out and touch the, the nail piercings in his body. And I was there also when Thomas' doubts vanished as he looked at Jesus and said, You are my Lord and my God. I was there when Thomas the doubter became Thomas the believer. And you can also experience that. Let me tell you about him. I was there. I touched him. I had him. I rejoiced. And, and so could you. John proves that Jesus is God and he does it specifically and strate strategically. He is intentional at sharing seven of the miracles of Jesus and also seven of his most important statements. Seven and seven. Perfect number, huh? In the scriptures. Seven miracles, seven statements. The, the seven statements are known as the I am statements of Jesus. And it's interesting because most of, it, of this content is found between chapter 1 and chapter 12 in the book of John. In fact, seven of the miracles and five of the seven statements take place in the first 12 chapters of the Gospel of John. John is seeking to build a case after making that statement that Jesus is actually God. And those first 12 chapters. And then he moves along into chapter 13 through 19, where he records the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. No other go uh, gospel writer does that. John is so impressed by his sacrifice that he decides to spend that much time in it. It's a thick dose of what happened to Jesus those last days. And then in chapter 20, he records his resurrection. And in chapter 21, you find the epilogue. 
So it's a simple outline if you want to, you know, picture it in your mind. Chapters 1 to 12 is about evidence to show that Jesus is God. So we would believe. Chapter 13 to 19 records the days where Jesus died. Chapter 20, his resurrection. And chapter 21, the epilogue, the, the closing. Now look at the statements. The seven statements that John quotes. He uses the statements to, to prove that Jesus is God. And they're amazing. The seven I am statements. Because he calls himself the I am for a reason. Remember Moses when he met God in that burning bush? He saw that bush and it was not burning down. It was not consuming. And, and he hears God's voice. And at the end of the conversation, Moses asks him, Who are you? And God says, I am that I am. God didn't need to explain himself. He is. He has always been. He will always be. He's the self-existent one. He's the I am. And, and later when, when Moses is, is uh, charged with this, with this uh, command of, of getting the children of Israel out of Egypt, he says, who, who, who can I tell Pharaoh that sent me? And, and God says, tell him that the I am sent you. But you see, for some people, the phrase was not completed. I am? You are what? So God inserts Jesus in time. And seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am, and follows it up with something he is. I am the bread of life. You are to partake of me to eat the symbol of my flesh and drink the symbol of my blood so you can have life. I am your sustainer. Number two, he says, I am the light of the world. Without me, you will stumble in darkness and you'll be blind. He also says, I am the door. I am the only way that a person can enter into heaven. He says, I am the good shepherd. In other words, I want to lead you. And if you yield to surrender your life to me and follow me, I do have a plan for you. I'll lead you. I am the good shepherd. I will take you through the darkest place and also to the greatest places you've ever imagined. Just let me in. Let me guide you. Number five, I am the resurrection. With Jesus, there is an absolute guarantee of eternal existence, eternal life. Without tears, without death, without sorrow. In a way that we have never imagined. Number six, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We don't know the meaning and the purpose of life until we come to know Jesus. And then he says, I am the vine. Just hold on to me. Just hold on to me as a branch. And I'll make sure you're safe. Hold on for a ride though. But I'll get you there. Everything you need will come from the source. The vine. And it'll, I'll come out to you. And you'll have everything you need. I'm going to make you produce fruit. I'm going to take you from being nutty to being fruity. So in the Gospel of John, you see how Jesus shows up and finishes the conversation that got started with Moses in the Old Testament. I am, but so you'll have no doubt. I am those seven things. As a matter of fact, when Jesus said, before Abraham, I was. The Pharisees wanted to stone him. They got it. Now, the seven miracles go like this. Number one, 
He changes water into wine. The very first miracle that Jesus ever did. We're going to look at it in a, in, a, in a few more weeks. Number two, how Jesus healed the nobleman's son. Number three, how he healed the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda. By the way, that's a really cool stop when you go to Jerusalem. Number four, when Jesus feeds the 5,000. Number five, when he walks on water. Number six, when he heals the blind man. Number seven, when he raised Lazarus from the dead. All of the seven miracles are very crucial and strategic. And they're pointing at the case that John is making that Jesus is God. I'm stoked to get into this book, if you haven't noticed. One last thing about John. In his gospel, John calls himself five times the disciple whom Jesus loved. Right? You heard that. Because his writing, his gospel, was not about himself. It was about Jesus. John didn't even want to get us distracted with himself. He doesn't even mention his own name in the book. Others do, not him. And when he talks about himself, he does it in reference of Jesus and his love. John was completely sure that Jesus loved him. That's why he wanted to talk about him. John didn't even imagine himself away from the name of Jesus. John recognized that he was John because of Jesus. That his life didn't make sense. That life was, 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 was not about his intelligence or his experience or his expertise. His life was all about Jesus and his love. He believed that Jesus loved him. With all his heart, without any hesitation. Why was he so sure? It dawned on me that he uses the expression that disciple whom Jesus loved as he is describing the events surrounding the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. You see, in chapters 1 and 12, John never mentions it. But then John 13 comes, and John's mind reflects back to what Jesus did when he instituted communion, how he was sweating drops of blood. How he was arrested in Gethsemane and he was beaten and tortured. And he gets to the point in his letter when he starts to say, Jesus, he loved me. I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. Remember, all the other disciples flaked. They bailed on Jesus. All of them betrayed him. All of them, but one who stuck around. John is the person who could look somebody in the eye and say, I was there. I heard with my own ears that terrifying kind of sound of his moaning. A sound I've never heard coming out of his mouth. I heard it. I saw his precious blood coming out of him. I saw his hands. I saw his feet. Only John can say, I saw God's own son hanging on a cross. I was there. I remember that puddle of blood. I was there crying, weeping, confused, afraid to even look up at him. I was wondering why. Guys, do something. Jesus, do something. Come down. And I heard the people mocking him, spitting on him, trashing him. I saw him and, and I wondered, why wouldn't he just take his finger to squish him all like bugs? Frustrated and held 
his mama for hours. And we sat together at the foot of the cross, just weeping. Only John can say. Only John can say that. Only John can say that he was there when Jesus changed the game. John can say, I was there and I saw him all of a sudden gasping for air. And that scream out of the top of his lungs, Tetelestai, it is finished. And when I looked up, I was expecting to see that man agonizing about to die. But he was not in defeat. I saw that his demeanor had changed. I saw the beaten, bloody, wounded warrior. But his face was the face of a champion. I saw that expression on his face when he looked up and breathed his last breath. And I can tell you, it was absolute victory and triumph. And then I, I saw his body collapse at once and I knew he loves me. He did all that for me. So I don't know about you, but I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. I was there. Then I saw how Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, two wealthy and highly respectful Jewish leaders, lose their careers, their jobs, lose all their status. They decided to stop being phony Pharisees and they came in their wealthy pharisaical robes, wrenched the nails out of his hands and took his body down. They dropped their religious pride and they let the blood stain their religious robes. I see what God can do with churchy people. I know that he can rescue even those who claim that have God in, his, in their hearts. So yes, it was easier for John to understand the reality of Jesus' love. And so this series, I pray that he will take us through that experience, to that perspective of that man, that young disciple who had no doubt that Jesus was God and he loved him. And we will experience his passionate desire to bring us into a deeper relationship with him. Finish quoting the Ministry of Healing page 397. God desires them to become all that he has made it possible for them to be and to do their very best with the powers he has given them. I know that God wants to do amazing things in us and through us as we grow closer to the Son of God. And I pray at the end of this series we will be able to join John and say with certainty, I am the disciple whom Jesus loved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we part ways today, we want to thank you for the gospel of John. Can't wait, Father, because I know that this is going to be an amazing adventure. Looking through the eyes of the disciple, digging into his heart, In digesting his perspective on your son, Jesus Christ. Father, as, as we go about this week, please bring us back to the word. Don't let us waste another week without growing closer to Jesus. Father, may the gospel of John inspire us. To love him as John did. And to have the complete assurance that no matter what happens in our lives, he loves us back. Heavenly Father, take us home. 
and help us to cling to that promise that he will come back to get us. Help us to experience or at least to, to enjoy a little glimpse of John's perspective on, on your lovely son. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Father, we praise you for your grace. And we do this knowing that you will continue guiding us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you because he is God. In his precious holy name we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we, we leave, um, I would like to uh, encourage you to, um, to continue studying. If you have time this week, go through the book of John. There's 21 chapters, and again, the conversations that he records are amazing. You, you, please go ahead. Read the material b- before we go through the class. And, and let's, let's grow together closer to the Lord. Um, if, if you would like to support the ministry of this church, there's, uh, there's a table at the foyer where you can leave your tithe envelope, where you can uh, also leave your offerings. If you would like to do it online, there's a website on the screen, www.sanmarcusadventist.com. Uh, and I pray and hope that you'll have a blessed week, church family. Have a happy Sabbath. God bless you.